asked if I wanted if you wanted me on video because yeah 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 okay okay I hope I look okay I'm sort of like just the end of the day I'm kind of like <laughs> go throw on makeup and stuff <laughs> all right hello everybody and welcome to a another coffee chat like you have not had coffee chat here on adventures with Sarah in I don't know some time now it seems like it's been gosh a long time, maybe a year or something like that. But I thought it would be really fun to get back in the habit of talking to some of my favorite people on Mondays here with you guys. So I am reinitiating our coffee chat um, program today with a friend of mine who I, for some mysterious reason, have not had on my Facebook page before, which is really strange because it seems obvious. So <laughs> we did we did a live a live thing when you came here in 2020. Yes, we did do a live walk together. So so to introduce you guys, those of you who have not met her before, this is my friend Alyssa Bernard, who is uh, the creator of RomeWise, which is a website that is basically kind of the ultimate guide to Rome. I mean, you've got all the information that's always consistently updated and all that. So it's kind of the website for Rome. And she's actually just launched a new project um, where she's doing the same kind of format, but for Florence. So it's Florence Wise is your new project, right? Yes, that's it. <laughs> that's exciting. So it is very about, exciting. <laughs> so I know your story, but the people watching probably don't. So tell tell us a little bit about how you ended up in Italy because you're in Rome and how you ended up having this very, um, very popular blog. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for that great introduction. <laughs> um, it's a little circuitous, but I will try to be as brief as I can. So I used to work in software, basically, in the U.S. I was a contractor doing software uh, programming and training actually and then I met Alessandro my husband and he is from Rome I was living in Boston at the time and came to Italy on a backpacking trip with a friend and uh he was working at the hotel where we stayed in Rome which is one of those kismet moments he wasn't even supposed to be working the night that I checked in uh but they called him because they were busy and so we met that night um, so, you know, one of those fate kind of things. And it was truly love at first sight. I mean, it didn't, didn't seem like it in the moment, but it definitely, um, things went very quickly. We, we saw each other while I was here visiting and then he came to the States and I came back, et cetera, et cetera. And that was in, uh, 1997. That's a long time ago. <laughs> That's a very long time ago. And we got married in 1999. So, um, we actually initially lived in the States and then we moved back here, Alessandro had been working in a hotel when I met him and he said, oh, you know, we can open a bed and breakfast. And it's this whole, uh, you know, the, the year 2000, that was um, a big deal here because it was the Jubilee and it was Y2K and everybody was opening bed and breakfast right and left. And so we decided to do the same thing and we didn't do it until uh, 2001. And by the time we got here, it was, well, we were, um, we, we started our business on October 4th of, of 2001, which is literally uh, not even a month after 9-11. So it was a very, very stressful moving here that had just happened. It was horrific. And we had been away uh, on our sort of last hurrah trip before moving to Rome. And we were in Tonga and Fiji and when that happened. And so we came back here and just thought, oh my gosh, how are we going to start a tourism business with this you know, this gloom? And slowly but surely, uh, we did start our little bed and breakfast and we we opened in uh, at the end of of 19 sorry of 2001 and 18 years later we got out of the bnb business in uh 2018 so luckily uh in time to get out before the whole pandemic thing hit and but along the way we just uh, collected a ton of information about what people wanted to know in rome just coming to the counter can you help me with this? And it's not only the obvious things like how to skip the line at the Vatican, but other things, you know, sort of more nuanced kinds of things, you know, uh, are there Citibank ATMs in Rome? You know, this is one of the weird questions that nobody looks for on the internet, but if you look for it, I mean, it's one of those things that I know people want to know. So uh, for almost 20 years of helping people, listening to people, and just really knowing what people are looking for, but also knowing Rome, that's how I started this, you know, little project to see if I could sort of create a little website and if it would work. And then it did. And by the time we got out of the B and B, uh, Rome Wise was in full steam ahead, and things were going really great. Nineteen nine, uh, sorry, <laughs> twenty nineteen and and uh, twenty twenty. And then, well, you know what happened? 
so that's where we are now. That's so cool. And it's funny because it's kind of like, it feels almost like a similar story to my story, which is that I never intended to do this. It was that I, yeah, I started a website because people were asking so many questions about these packing videos that I was doing. And I decided instead of repetitively answering emails, let's just make a website where we can store that information. And it was basically the same thing for you and Alessandra, right? Yeah, it was. Well, what happened with with uh, us is that we we had our hotel and somebody came up to me and said a friend of mine, she was selling uh, advertising for websites um, a long time ago. This is in 2009. And she said, you know, your your B&B website has all this white space. You could put Google ads on there and earn some money. And I thought that is no way. That is not a way to earn money. You don't put ads on a, on a B&B or a hotel website. I mean, that's not how it works. Your Your website is there to take reservations. But she gave me the idea and I thought, what if I could take the FAQ page that I had written (laughs) and, um, you know, do something with that. So I looked up on Google, you know, how to build a website. (laughs) That's what I did. And I started to build this little website um, and I took my FAQ page and I started making page. My very first page ever was, uh, is the Roma Pass worth it? Now that page has been copied. I don't know how many times. I mean, literally word for word, people have copied my page, but it for a very long time, it was the number one. (laughs) Uh, page on Google when you type that in, because I knew that was the number one question. Everybody was coming and asking me, should I get this Roma pass? Since then, I mean, I've had I've obviously created a lot more content, but um, yeah, that was the idea was just taking what I knew people wanted to know, taking it from my FAQ page, expanding it. It was a, it was a kind of a, uh, it was a challenge to myself, you know, can I do this? Because our hotel website had been built by, you know, hotel website builders. And I just kind of wanted to see, you know, am I capable of doing this? And and that's how it started as kind of a little challenge. And I didn't even realize that it could grow to be what it has grown to be. And by the time we started coming out of the pandemic and things were, you know, uh, recuperating, I just thought now or never to launch Florence Wise, because it had always been the idea to do more cities, because we know Florence really well. We know some other cities as well, too. And so you can see where this is going. Uh, But I just realized, you know, we have to just do it. And so we started working on launching this and we've been working on it the last year and we finally launched it now. And um, here we are. I didn't anticipate getting to this point, but here we are. Isn't that the funny thing? It's like, I feel like everybody in our sort of similar zone, like none of us really like set out to do this, which is exactly why, just for the guy, you guys watching, why I know Alyssa, because in 2019 or something, I decided that I needed to find people like me. I needed to find my tribe because I did not have the right tribe. And I thought, I'm going to find these people because there, these people are out there, especially women who are journalists who are covering Italy. We all are there for some reason that, and we all have similar motivations, I think. And I thought, you know, I'm super, super in favor of collaboration. I think that we all like rafted together lifts everybody, you know, and I, it's just, it's a fun thing because yeah, none of us have a straight line, right? None of us went, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an Italian travel journalist. <laughs> I think, I think certainly you and I and, and our tribe, for sure. I think there's a generation of us and I'm not trying to age us, but I think there's a generation of us that started doing this, you know, for fun or, oh, it seemed like a good, you know, sort of logical next step. Like you said, taking the stuff you were already doing and, and sort of, expanding on that. Um, I think there is a younger generation that is saying, I want to go be, you know, a, I want to be a blogger. I want to create this, this thing because I'm, I'm seeing it. You know, there definitely are all kinds of, you know, this term content creator. I don't know if you don't like it or like it, but that's the, what, what it is, you know, these content creators that are coming up uh, all the time and they're great. You know, there's a lot of new people that are doing new things. And I think it's just a constant now. I think it's, uh, it's one of those new careers that people today are looking to do where you, we didn't look for this. You know, I was in software and you were in, uh, you know, the, the travel business, but not this. And, you know, we sort of, like you said, morphed into these careers because we saw a need and we had an understanding of the market. And we also have a love for Italy and all those things together. But yeah. I'm wondering if people today are actually creating these, these, yeah things for these lifestyles for themselves from from day one. I think that there may be people doing that. I think that something that I have noticed that's a constant between you and me and like our mutual group of friends is that we aren't 
18 year olds jumping off of a waterfall. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's, I, actually, that's I, I, mean. I have to say, I almost a little bit take offense to the term influencer. I know that people have said, oh, you're a travel influencer. And I'm this like, this is why I don't use this term. I don't use yeah. it. We are influencers, but I don't use this term because I think we're so much more than that. I don't, you know, I, I just don't. I mean, I get, I get why people would say that about us, especially about, you know, what I do. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm an architect and I'm, I'm a tour guide and I'm a travel journalist. Like those are right. those things to me. Okay. All of those things point to influencing people's travel decisions. But I think I find the, the whole, it's very reductive to call somebody an influencer, right? I absolutely agree. It's, it's, um it's, it's sort of trite. And I'm sure, again, I'm sure that there is a younger generation of people that like that term and even aspire to be that. I know that, you know, they've done studies and this X percent of, of kids in school today are, you know, aspiring to be content creators or, or uh, influencers. I actually just saw this very interesting article in the New York Times about uh, people who are getting out of the influencing business because they're super stressed. Yeah. And they're not living their best life. And they had this article about this one woman, I don't remember her name, but um, she was thrilled to have a full-time job where she, you know, it's sort of a nine to five where she'd go to work and she would come home and just be done. <laughs> I know. Um, and, and this is so true. Like I, it, I just think it's so funny because I have the worst boss in the world and that's myself. I am the worst boss in the world because I no, never I'm the worst boss, boss in the world. <laughs> for you but yeah like yeah. I was at Disneyland last week and I actually sent my team like a note saying please don't bother me I'm on vacation with my my family at Disneyland but I still got emails and I got pinged about this that and the other thing that needs to be done right. and it's just like people that think that having a fun travel website I'm going to go do that it's going to be fun it's like do you know how sore my feet are after pounding the pavement in cities to get opening hours prices on things, you know, talk to people. It's just like, it's a, it's a black hole of work. So it's great yeah. for people like me who are like, um, workaholics. <laughs> exactly. I think that's the, I think that is the key word. You know, we can use the word content creator or influencer, but I think the correct word is workaholic. And that is another one of those overused phrases that people used. I don't know, some, some time ago to sort of describe this work stress, you know, being overwrought or whatever, but it does take this, it does take this kind of dedication and this decision to really, I mean, I work on my business more than full-time and I know you do too. And any of us, all of us who are in this tribe, as you say, when you're really dedicated as we are and you really love what you do, you put in more than 100% and it shows. That's how you become and stay successful. And you will not become or stay successful if, if you go at it in a half-hearted way. I mean, there are a lot of people who can do this sort of, you know, just kind of on a lighthearted way and maybe just post a blog post here or there, but maybe they're not looking to do what we do, which is run this as a full-time business and support ourselves. Yeah, I think that it's it's definitely more complicated and more difficult than than people think, and especially from the informational point of view. Because having done guidebooks for so, for more than twenty years, and I I know how much work you put into this new website. Like I know that you have to literally go door to door to every museum. You have to walk through every single one, make sure the art is in the place you say it's going to be. You have to make sure the hours are correct. Which in Florence, good luck. Like throw a throw a dart <laughs> at the wall, and you might be right. You know. It's like that stuff is just infuriatingly time consuming. Uh, and I don't think people realize how time consuming all, I mean, it, it sounds super glamorous, but uh, the sores on my feet after a good month of researching would, would tell you it's not as glamorous as it looks. I mean, it is great, right? We love what we do, but it's, it's not nearly uh, as easy. But I will say one thing I love about you is that one of the first things that you and I ever did is we went out for a walk and both of us pulled out our cameras to take pictures of a sunset or something. And I'm like, <laughs> It's my person. She doesn't <laughs> mind if I stop and I take pictures or I do a little a little YouTube video real quick while we're here, you know. Oh no, I, we I, totally get each other. We absolutely get each other. And <laughs> you know, I think part of it comes from I don't I don't have a sense of I need to do this. I want to. I want to share yes. because I see something beautiful. So Alessandra and I are going to Florence again this week. We're going pretty much at least once a month right now. You know, poor us. We have to go to Florence once a month. Um, <laughs> it's only an hour and a half away. So um, because I want to get pictures of the wisteria. 
yeah. in gardens and um, from Piazza di Michelangelo. And I want to see the Iris Garden and get all these photographs. Now, I actually can get photographs. Um, I have uh, sources in Florence and get me these photographs. But we want to go. I want to have our own experience of being able to write about it and talk about it. So, um, you know, it's from wanting to share from from what we see and what we love and what we experience. I, that's where the passion comes from. And any of our readers or followers would know if we were inauthentic, you know, if we were um, doing it in a sort of a robotic way and a sort of a feeling like we have to. Um, I think that our passion for what we do and a passion for the places that we visit, you know, I know you go all over the world, Sarah, and I've never seen you go any place that you didn't love. Um, and I think that that shows through your, your readers know that you're passionate about where you go and the people there. Yeah. You well, know, what, and it comes through, right? You know, that's, I think that the, the discovery of, of the universality of humanity, that kind of stuff. I just, I love meeting people and seeing what is their life like and getting an insight into it just because <clears throat> we do have such a, a vast and diverse world. I think it's fascinating. I know that I'm an infuriating person to work with just because of the fact, oh, look, there's your cat. I had my she's, name. She What's wants cuddles, but she's not going to stay because she's nervous. That What's, your, nervous. What's your name? I have, we have three. This one's Coco. Coco. Oh, we had a Coco. Now we have Isis. Yeah, she's, and Coco. she's older mm. now. So she's getting a little needier, but she's always a pretty needy, a needy girl. But she's also <laughs> nervous and she's not going to like sitting here while I'm talking to you. So she'll <laughs> anyway, go ahead. <laughs> well, what I was what I was saying, though, is that um, I know I'm I'm hard to work with for like my assistant and for the guy who's helping us out with our website and stuff, because they, everybody wants a content calendar. They want to know what's coming next. What are we going to talk about this month? And I'm like, I don't know, because I'm just going to see what inspires me. Because if I were to be more robotic about it and say, this month, we're talking about blah, this month, we're talking about blah, like that stuff's great organizationally, but it, it's more like I need to be walking down the street and see some, like I'm going to Morocco on Friday. Like I want, I need to be able to walk down the street and see somebody weaving a carpet and go and ask them, how did you do that? What did you use to make the dye for that particular color? Like, I want to find out. And, but I, I don't know that ahead of time. Right. So spontaneity, you know, <clears throat> it's the Italian chaos has seeped into my brain <laughs> is what it is. I think we have to leave room for that or we wouldn't love what we do. There has to be room for fun. And for, I mean, what we do is absolutely a business because you and I both run businesses. We support ourselves. We support our family. I mean, you know, but there has to be room for fun and there has to be room for um, spontaneity. And what is that word? Um, serendipity. Yes, I agree. Yep, I agree. There has to be room for that because otherwise we wouldn't, again, it's a sort of a catch 22. We wouldn't love what we do so much and it would show. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a combination of being, so I think what we have in common and what our readers like is, you know, we are foreigners that, you know, so we're coming at a place from a, a tourist standpoint, yet we are so much more ingrained in the place. So you're going to Morocco, you know Morocco. So you can be the bridge between the place you're going and the people that you're taking with you because they're tourists and they're new and they're sort of like, this is all maybe scary or, or unknown or kind of, you know, I don't know, just maybe it's just a little bit nerve wracking to go someplace you just don't know where you're going. Um, and we are that bridge because we understand tourists because we have been tourists before we ever got to know the place. And we also know the places where we are. I mean, I know Rome, like the back of my hand. I also know Florence really, really well. So we're that bridge between these people that are coming to us and looking for help and the places that we love. And I think yeah. that's the big difference is that we're not just, let's say another tourist saying oh I, I went to Rome and I loved it so I think I'll just write you know I'll write about it um yeah yeah I think that it's really it's a very interesting thing to be I think a bit like a cultural translator you know so it's it's fun to be that person that can kind of see both sides I remember so well an incident on a tour once that really like highlighted what it is that I do for a living because I had a, a it was the end of a tour the tour was over actually I had a client who was up arguing with the, the desk clerk at the hotel, at a hotel in Rome. And they were so mad and they were arguing because they're like this, they keep telling us we need to change rooms. I don't want to change rooms. Why should we have to change rooms? We don't have to change rooms. 
And the desk clerk is says to me in Italian, yes, they do, because this is not the room they booked. And they we, somebody else has that room, you know, and you understand how Italian hotels think. When you book a room, you book a room, you book room 307. And like, if that's your room and somebody else has that room the next day, you need to move, even if it's exactly the same room next door. The Ita Italians don't have that flexibility of concept of like, well, every hotel room is the same. So we'll just give the arriving guest a different hotel. It just doesn't make any sense to them. And it was just so funny sitting there because I was like, I totally see why the American is frustrated. And I completely understand where the Italian is coming from. Was exactly. Like, oh. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and in my case, especially as having run a hotel. So, I mean, some things initially for me were very hard to sort of fathom. I, I would offer my find myself, you know, sort of with my mouth hanging open going, what, what is that? why does that work that way? But now I do understand it. And um, I see a lot of comments from people and sometimes I just let it slide because I do understand that it's just, it is a different culture and there are certain ways that people think when they travel and, and sometimes we're ingrained in what we're used to. So um, in the way that Americans might be used to a certain way of booking, you know, hotel rooms or whatever, when they go abroad, the same with Italians, you know, when they go abroad. So it's, it's just a cultural thing and there's nothing right or wrong about it, but I now have a better understanding of the differences in what, you know, Americans are looking, not just Americans, I would say Anglo-Saxon travelers, um, are looking for when they're coming to, you know, these Mediterranean countries. And I'm so much more aware of the sort of Mediterranean way of doing things and the way of getting things done in a sort of circuitous <laughs> manner, but they get it done. That reminds me very much of a post I saw on your forum. And actually, by the way, she has a great forum on Facebook. It's a RomeWise group, kind of like the Adventures with Sarah travel group. So if you want to ask questions and things, it's sort of a group uh, crowdsourced uh, answers. There was somebody that posted, an, a young girl posted an experience about how much she hated Rome and how dirty it was and how she'd never spend time there again. And I just remember reading that and I was like, huh, interest. I mean, it was interesting to me to read somebody's very like visceral reaction. And what they were mad about was that it was dirty and there was garbage everywhere. And I was thinking to myself, Oh, honey, you should have, you should have come to Rome when I lived there in college. <laughs> dirty now. Project yourself back to 1995 when I lived in Rome. Let me just tell you, uh, you know, no. <laughs> but part of that is like, I think cultural expectation, right? You go to a place and you think it's going to be like, you know, like your downtown, like your mall, everything's going to be scrub clean and perfect, but that's just not the way Italy is, you know? And I think that that's part of our job as writers is to prepare people for the fact that it's not going to be the way your hometown is and that's okay, right? I had, you know, thank you for talking about the the Facebook group. It's a really fun group and people are so awesome in there. They are um, really helpful to each other. It's it's just fantastic. You know, people come in every day and say, I'm new to the group and I'm, I'm looking for the best hotel, you know, in Trust Devon or whatever. And people don't get tired of giving them sort of the same information over again. So it's really, really nice. There's a lot of camaraderie. Um, I, I posted something recently about the Trevi Fountain and, and the thing, it was just a my page about the Trevi Fountain and, you know, all about it, kind of the history and stuff. And the opening paragraph on the webpage, and it's sort of what I used to post on the social media was, you know, my favorite thing about the Trevi Fountain is as you approach it from a street, you know, from a block or so away, what's the one thing you notice? You know, the sound, you have this rushing water before you even get close to it. Yeah. And I posted that and so many people were related to that. It was really funny because I thought I was the only one, but so many people said, you know, oh my gosh, the sound of the water. But here's the funny thing. I had a few people say it wasn't nearly as big as I thought it would be. It was disappointing. And I had a few other people say it was enormous. It was amazing. Like they weren't answering the other people. They came in with, it was bigger than I thought. It was so huge. <laughs> so, you know, this perception thing that you were talking about, it, it's very personal. And the idea that Rome is dirty or has this, you know, characteristic uh, to it, it's definitely going to matter where you're coming from. It's, you know, we, we're not in a, in a vacuum. Yeah. So it depends where you come from. Yeah. And I mean, I think that it, the influencer culture is kind of problematic that way, right? Because I think we're setting up, 
unreasonable expectations. I always love when people post those like side by side photos of the influencer photo next to the actual photo, right? Yeah. Where you get these <laughs> yeah. photos of, of the girl in the flowy dress with a hand held behind and the Trevi fountain there. But then if you actually saw the whole photo, you'd see thousands of people around her kind of yeah. thing. And I just think some of that stuff, um, I think that I like to think of myself and I think you're the same as like the anti-influencer in the sense that like I would rather show things warts and all. Like I would rather people go to Rome and they go, you prepared me for graffiti, but I didn't see any, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'd rather, I, I'm, all, I'm a, very much a, in favor of um, having, of lowering everybody's expectations so that everyone's delightfully surprised, right? And I mean, there's also, you know, we also have the, I don't know, the sort of duality of when you're here, you know, when you, Sarah, are here and we're hanging out and we're walking around room, we don't notice graffiti and garbage and things like that because we're noticing, you know, the beauty around us, these incredible ruins, these beautiful palazzi, this, you know, flowers, whatever we, we, it's not that we are ignorant to it uh, or even that we pretend it doesn't exist. We just don't notice it because we notice other things. But I think it's different when you're coming here as a tourist and you have certain expectations and you've never seen Rome before, uh, just might depend on where your eyes take you. So it's it's very subjective, I think. But yeah, I think it is our job to sort of give people the best of both. Say, look, this is an amazing place, but it's not perfect. And I do try to say that on my pages. You know, I have a page about how to stay safe in Rome. And, you know, this is one of these contentions that people have is Rome safe. And I wrote yes. this page, how to stay safe in Rome. And you know what the number one thing that I say um, about staying safe in Rome, it's avoiding uh, being distracted because yeah. that's the number one thing I have seen. I have photos on this page of people walking across the street, wheeling luggage, looking at their phone. Um, people, you know, with selfie sticks and these are not supposed to be used in museums and whatnot, but of course they are. And you could easily like turn around and, and poke somebody or hurt somebody. So I think, these are the kinds of things, you know, that people can hurt themselves by getting sunstroke. You know, I, this happens whenever I've been in the emergency room in Rome and it has happened. <laughs> I've seen people in there from sunstroke, tourists, because they're not hydrating. And I think, you know, this is the kind of thing. It's not an unsafe city. I think you have to just be aware and take care of yourself and not let yourself uh, fall into these these problems. Yeah. Oh, I think Rome, Rome is for me safer than where I live. I prefer to yeah. walk around the streets of Rome than I do in Seattle because it's exactly, I would say a lot, lot, lot safer. So that's what I'm so saying just, that the number one distraction, the number one problem is you're being distracted or, you know, being on your phone or not using sunscreen or crossing the street, you know, against the light, um, these kinds of things. Yeah. So just to change gears a little bit. So for your new website, like what, what are were the things that were the most exciting for you when you were con when you were constructing it? And did you did were you did you find anything new that you didn't know about when you were doing this? <laughs> uh, I have to say, I ha with both Rome and Florence, I'm always finding new things. I mean, yeah. literally, even in Rome, and I've you know I've lived here twenty years. Um, the exciting thing was just knowing that we could make Florence more three dimensional for our readers and for us, because Florence was an always an aside, you know, when we had our uh, B and B, we, we would get people come to Rome and say, oh, we're gonna spend two to three days in Rome and then we're spending a week in Florence. And we'd be like, what? <laughs> what do you mean you're spending a week in Florence? Rome needs a week. <laughs> um, but, you know, my husband, Alessandro, he actually served uh, in the Carabinieri when he was younger and he lived in Florence for five years. So he knows it really well. I've been going up there for years between visits and family and we have friends up there. So, um, and you and I even ran into each other there once. I know, <laughs> just randomly. <laughs> <It was> random. <laughs> um, cool. So it was just the idea of bringing this so much more to life. That was really exciting because it had always been a sort of an aside, like we were focusing on Rome and, oh, here's a page about how to get to Florence from Rome on the train. But I wanted to do more than that. And I started making videos about Florence and they did really, really well because people are interested in, you know, what to do in Florence, just like Rome. I mean, they're two cities that are so close to each other and uh, are so, both of them must seize and eat in, in very different ways. So I was excited to bring that to life. And I was also really excited to have a completely different perspective of a place. Um, I'd read a lot about Florence's history and it's it's so different, you know, from Rome's. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously their histories uh, overlap on some some levels, but, it's exciting to 
learn more and more about Florentine history and try to bring that to life. And I think what I discovered the most about Florence, which I probably knew, but just now forcefully comparing the two cities is the incredible walkability of that city. Yes. We have never taken a taxi. We've never taken a bus. We've <laughs> I've never taken any form of public transportation other than the train to arrive. I mean, that's it. Every place we've ever been has been walkable. And while I love walking in Rome, you really, you kind of can't do that for your whole trip or you will just exhaust yourself. I mean, you can, but it's, you know, it's more. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about Florence as like some uh, a city that could fit into Rome's pocket, you know, in the same yeah. way that I, I think of them, I mean, they're obviously in order, right? Venice is like tiny, microscopic. Florence is bigger, maybe double. And then Rome is just ridiculous. Rome is huge. And well, it's huge even beyond the Centro Storico because there's so much outside even of the walls of the city. So, yeah, so it's it's magnitudes of order, isn't it? It's a, it doesn't quite, yeah, they're not. I mean, no, so if you're a tourist and you plant yourself, you know, in the Spanish steps or the, or the Pantheon, you stay right in the center, you probably could even get away with a two and a half day visit to Rome on foot. You know, just kind of seeing, you do a lot of walking, but you could. Um but it would still be way, way more walking than you would do in Florence. And oh. I think that, for example, the Vatican alone requires so much energy and walking that to walk to and from there is already overkill. So for me, take some sort of transportation to get to the Vatican because you're going to need all your energy while you're there is kind of a thing. Whereas in Florence, you know, you can walk to the Uffizi and then you're there, but you're also like probably five minutes from your hotel. <laughs> so um, that's one of the things that I think, it's not that I didn't know it, but just living it so much these past few months that we've been going up there so much has really just been a pleasant surprise. Yeah. Yeah, it's. It, I really like that about Florence that it's easy to get around. And I think it's also for, from an intellectual point of view, I think Florence is a little easier for visitors to wrap their minds around because Rome is too much of everything, right? Because you're trying to keep track of ancient history, but what is ancient history? That's broken into pieces as well. Then you have this kind of middle period that people don't know anything about. And then you have the middle ages and then you have the Renaissance and then you have the, I mean, there's just so much. Whereas Florence well, Baroque. Is kind of like, if you love Baroque here, I mean, that's Rome is well, and, and even up to the 19th century and the Risorgimento, yeah. I mean, it's like there's too, it's too much of everything, which is what we love about Rome, right? Florence is nice because intellectually it's very soothing because you're going to see the 14 and 1500s. Yep. That's what you're going to see, Absolutely. baby. That's it. <laughs> but it's and not so simplistic. Church, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you go into a church and you discover a chapel that Ghirlandaio did and it just knocks your socks off and you can take an hour just in that chapel alone examining you know every little inch of it so it's it's not some I mean it it is you know all renaissance of course mostly renaissance of course some medieval uh and there's even some ancient stuff there you know Santa Reparata underneath the the Duomo and stuff but mostly it's renaissance but it is so intense it's absolutely as complex as Rome um in terms of just the sheer number of things that you can see about the renaissance but Rome is no slouch where the Renaissance is concerned either. I mean, look at the Vatican, look at the Sistine Chapel. You know? In organizationally for my brain, I think of Rome as vertical or horizontal in the sense that it's a long timeline, whereas yeah. I see Florence as vertical because it's very deep on one particular subject. So it's a different, yeah. a different way of thinking, I think, about things. And that's why I would assume when you were constructing your new website that you have to think of it differently, right? You have to approach it differently. Oh my gosh, yes. I'm I, you know, I, I'm doing some of the pages similarly to what I did on the Rome website. So obviously, you know, Florence in April, Florence in May, Florence at Christmas, um, uh, top sites and all those kind of pages that you need. But there are going to be different kinds of pages on Florence wise uh, that we will not have on Rome wise and vice versa, just because there are different topics. So um, I recently just did a video on my YouTube, uh, top 10 ancient top 10 I mean there are like hundreds but you know top 10 of my favorite ancient Roman sites in Rome that you can see without crowds besides the Colosseum so you know you get to Rome and I've had people say I'm not going to the Colosseum it's crazy I just you know so I gave a whole list of other sites now that is an irrelevant topic for Florence you know True. um but a topic that's relevant for Florence is top free churches to visit because you know so many of the very popular churches in Florence are uh, require a 
you know, an entry fee, Santa Maria Novella and uh, Santa Croce and San Lorenzo. So, you know, what are the best free churches in Florence? That's a topic that's irrelevant to Rome because the churches here are all free. Yeah, so that's true. Of, of, uh, they are talking about implementing a uh, an entry fee for the Pantheon. And it seems like that's going to move forward. So I'm sort of waiting for that. They said they're going to do it as soon as they can implement the um, mechanism for doing so, whatever that means. So that's so interesting because <laughs> I thought from what I had read that it was presently ready, like they were ready. But then again, it is Rome. And how many years have they been talking about putting a fee at the Pantheon? I'm going to say somewhere around 15. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've been hearing grumblings about this. And then it sort of they stop grumbling. The long story short is it seems like they really want to do this. There's a new tourism minister. They want to do this. They're talking about the fact that it needs upkeep. I had heard once this sort of argument that outside the Pantheon, it was all Rome and inside it's all the Vatican and they couldn't sort of decide. That's not actually really true. Um, and the bottom line is that it's, it is managed by different entities. One is the city of Rome and the other. Anyway, <laughs> I, I don't blame them for wanting to put a fee on entry because most people are not going in there to see it as a church. They're going to see it as a ruin, as a monument, and it needs upkeep. So I, I'm not against this. I do think it's going to need some very good implementation because, you know, the ticketing systems right now for the Vatican and the Colosseum, I mean, this is a huge problem right now, as I think you know. Um, so we'll see what happens. But you know. I would say the, the only thing about the Pantheon that would be, I mean, I, I disagree with the whole let me just say that up front. I disagree with putting an admission price on the on the Pantheon from my personal point of view, which is that's where I like to meet my friends. <laughs> like I like to meet you at the Pantheon. Let's meet at the Pantheon. I know, you know? I know, I know. So, I mean, and it's it's sad to take that away as a thing where you can just pop in. I, but I don't, I also think it's a little bit more difficult to justify an entry fee because it is pop in, pop out kind of thing. I mean, you don't spend an hour in the Pantheon. Like even, yeah. even if you tried, even if me as a guide, I tried to spend an hour in there with the group, I'd be stretching it. Like most people, most groups go in there for maximum 10 minutes. Like it's not really a thing that I think warrants a, a significant yeah. fee, but the problem is it's a slippery slope, right? Once you start charging that entry fee, it's just going to go up, 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 up. And Sarah, do you, did you ever come to Rome when the Roman forum was free? Oh, yeah. Yeah. When I lived in Rome. Yeah, it was free. So yeah. many people, even right now on this Facebook group that I have, are of a different generation. And so many say, you know, in answer to a post that I'll put about tickets to the Roman Forum, because people often ask, you know, this question about, can you, can I visit the Roman Forum before I go to the Colosseum? The answer is yes. Um, and so many people come back and say, what do you mean? You have to pay to go in the forum? I thought it, it was free. And it's like, no, it's been, a, and a few people think that that's due to COVID, but it's been like that since about 15 years um, that there's been a oh, fee. Oh, more, and more. 15 it's been years. Like that in the entire time I've been a tour guide. So that's at least since 2000. It's been. Yeah, since, it I, moved back, here, since I moved here. Yeah, it went back and forth because at, at a certain point, the Colosseum you had to pay for, but the Rome, the call, but the forum was free. And then it flipped for some reason that the Colosseum was free and then the Roman Forum was free. This was in the mid-90s. Oh, that's new. That would be. I've only known that the Colosseum you had to pay for. And ever since I moved here in 2001, uh, you had to pay for the Roman Forum, but it was sort of newish. Um, so I mean, people have gotten used to this now because it's just the way it is. So I think that if they do implement a fee for the Pantheon good or bad, um, people will eventually get used to it. But I agree with you. It's sort of, you can't charge a lot. On the other yeah. hand, it is it is a unique monument. And if they do need the funds for upkeep, I just hope that they actually, you know, go towards that. Because as I said, uh, I don't want to get into a whole polemic here, but the, you know, the ticketing for the Colosseum and the and the Vatican is is very problematic in this moment. And they're not managed by the same companies. And I don't even think that the Pantheon ticketing would be managed by the same company either. I hope not, but um, we'll see yeah. what happens. We'll see what happens. So this is, this is very different in Florence. You know, you go to Florence and it's just the way it is. If you want to visit some of these churches, you have to pay a fee. Um, so, but I will say I give Florence a lot of credit in the sense that they they have all of their monuments 
kind of tied together with the exception of the Duomo. And the Duomo has a really nice organized pass. So you can just get a pass and you can do all the things. It's fantastic. First, it's so it's well fantastic. organized. So there's basically only two entities you're going to deal with within Florence. You're going to deal with the Opera del Duomo so you can get the tickets for all right. that stuff. And then you're dealing with the whatever cultural ministry or something. I don't remember what it is to do all of the other stuff. And you can get yeah. the Florence card, which covers almost all that stuff. So it it's it is so well organized. And they also have very civilized. Good, um, it's yeah, civilized. civilized. Is it not? I think, and uh, it's my understanding, they also have very good options. This is not related to any of our readers, really, but they have very good options for people who live there. So people who live there don't have to pay all these these yeah. fees to go into, you know, into all of these things. Um, so no, it is it is true. Florence is easy. And again, so that's this that's an example of some of the different kinds of content that we'll we'll be writing um, for Florence wise. There's uh, the usual stuff, you know, how to visit uh, the Uffizi, you know, without any stress and that kind of thing, how to take uh, kids to the Uffizi, all those kind of things. But there will also be things that are very specific to Florence. And we are, you know this, Sarah, I mean, we love, love, love art and history. And so there'll be a lot about that. Like I'm I'm doing a roundup now of all of the the Last Supper's you know, those, those frescoes, the Cenacoli, um, that, you know, we don't really have here in Rome, those paintings. Yeah. I mean, there, there are a few, there's, you know, one obvious one inside of the Sistine Chapel, but, um, <laughs> but, <Is> there? <laughs> uh, there is, <laughs> yeah. what do you know? Anyway, um, no, you find them in Rome, but it's nothing like, I mean, the ones in Florence are the frescoes from the Renaissance masters that Leonardo da Vinci was inspired by. So, I mean, they are the original Last Supper frescoes. So these are the kind of things that I want to share. You know, a lot of these little hidden gems. Oh God, I hate that word. I just can't believe I said it. I've tried so hidden hard to gem. avoid using the word hidden gem. Um, little secret spots, let's say. <laughs> yeah, but you know, even beyond secret spots, I think the the way I like to talk about this stuff is just what are my favorites. You know, if you're a person and you trust me and you like what I do. I have ideas of things I like that you might also like. So in a way it's almost, it's taste, isn't it? It's not, because I'm, it I'm not sure it's, it's, anymore. It's how I put it on both of the sites. Like, don't you wish you had a friend there to sort of take you around and tell you what to see and do? Because we can all say, oh, go to the Coliseum. But, you know, um, there's certain churches in Rome that I think most people never really get to see, like Santi Quattro, which is just, you know, beautiful church. And I think so many people miss it because they don't know about it. And I love to share that because it's so yeah. special. Um, yeah. and, and same with Florence, you know, there's, it's so easy. And of course, most people, it's normal, you have two and a half days, I get it. Most people do not have time to go running around and seeing these things. But quite a lot of people come back and want to see different things, or they have extra time. And so um, I hope, you know, for all of those people that we can reach them with our or suggestions, yours and mine. Well, I think the other, the other thing that's interesting that we can, that we have, I think, well, this is a personal mission of mine, and I think you share the same mission, is to expose the fact that people can go to Rome without seeing the Colosseum and the Vatican. People can go to Florence without seeing the Uffizi. Like, there are many ways to crack those eggs, and you don't have to do it the way all of the big tour operators tell you. And in fact, so many ticketing issues, are get, they're getting to be so infuriating to, to get, that in some ways, like, you can see amazing ancient Roman ruins on the Chalian Hill where there's nobody. <laughs> Like, I mean, that's amazing. You can go to see free frescoes in the middle of Florence, steps from the Uffizi that are beautiful Renaissance masterpieces. There's nobody there and it's free and you can get yeah. within inches of them. Like, yeah. I just think that this is the mission for me is two things, I guess. One is to, to point out to people, you don't have to do what everybody else is doing to get the same result. The feeling will be, you'll get a, you know, you'll get the feeling of what that time period is or that important piece of art or whatever. And the other piece I think that we need to be screaming from the rooftops is you don't need to go in September. <laughs> you can go <laughs> any other time. You really can. You can go right now. In fact, March, April, May, fantastic. Thumbs up. <laughs> it's so funny. To this, to this day, don't people are still shocked to find September and October, you know, packed. Um, yeah. I mean, I have to agree with you completely about, you know, you and I have the luxury of saying, well, we've been to the Colosseum, we've been to the Vatican, we've been to the Uffizi, so we can say, oh, you don't need to do that. Um, but I think you have a really good point because it those things are not necessarily for everyone. 
Um, yep, that's the answer. <laughs> we have a we have a, a, a few people helping us write, and one of the the guest writers uh, wrote the top tips for visiting the Uffizi. And her number ten tip, I absolutely love this. I left it exactly how she wrote it. If tromping through an art museum for two and a half hours is not for you, skip it. Yeah. It you know, not everybody has to be into art. Uh, just because you come to Florence, and don't get me wrong, you know, I love art. You love art. A lot of people love art, but it doesn't have to be for you. Uh, you might be more into doing outdoors things. You might be more into eating and drinking, shopping, uh, just relaxing and walking around. So I think um, it's very valid to say that if somebody's not into, you know, a two and a half hour visit to an art museum, such as the Vatican Museums, the, the, the Uffizi, the Louvre, I mean, any of these, you know, they use these terms must sees, but they're not must sees if that's not what what you're into. Uh, it doesn't no, have to I, be for everyone. And I think that people need permission to be okay with that, because I really do feel like there's a lot of societal pressure, like psychological pressure from the internet telling me if I don't see the Sistine Chapel, then I'll die an incomplete person. And the reality <laughs> is most people that walk through the Sistine Chapel, I'm going to, I'm going to roughly say 80% of the people who walk through the Sistine Chapel don't know what they're looking at and don't appreciate it at all. And I just think, you know, if you know about it, if it interests you, if it's something important to you, absolutely go. If it's something that you're like, yeah, I, it's a bucket list. Somebody told me I should go. Maybe don't, you know, maybe, maybe there's something that would be more well suited to your tastes. And I think that is a point of view. I hope we can kind of promote a little bit and say, examine yourself before you make your travel plans and don't be so lockstep with what people tell you is good to do because there's so much, you know, and that is what's cool about what you're doing and stuff that I do as well is we actually talk about the options because a lot of people yeah. don't know what the options are. You know, when you go to Florence, it's the Uffizi. Nobody knows that there are other things you can potentially do, right? Oh my gosh, for sure. I mean, I love the Uffizi and Alessandro and I spend five and six hours in there. Uh, I can't spend less than three hours in there, but that's me. I mean, I'm an art <laughs> sort of <laughs> freak that way, but you can easily go to Florence and not see a single museum and you can still see Michelangelo. There's that David right there in Piazza della Signoria. There's the, the bronze one up in Piazza della Michelangelo. You don't have to go inside of the Academia. Yeah. Um, again, as you, you know, to your point, churches, but even if you don't walk inside of a single church or museum and you simply walk around outside, you know, both of these cities, as they say, you know, it's a little overused term, but it's really true. They are open air museums. You can just enjoy the beauty of these cities, you know, walking along the Arno and Florence and, and the Ponte Vecchio, or even not the Ponte Vecchio, it could be any other bridge, uh, walking along the Ultra Arno, um, or just eating. enjoying <laughs> or eating you could just spend your whole time eating different things because oh, I can do that I can easily do that I can just go <laughs> you know go to Florence and do nothing but eat and drink believe me no problem um so yeah, yeah I think I think it's uh I think you're absolutely right I think we have to be good ambassadors for letting people know that there's so much to see and do and it's also okay to not do a lot you know to enjoy your time relax and enjoy your time as well because you're on vacation and it shouldn't be you get home and you need a vacation from your vacation uh <laughs> But also, I think that that for me, I try to say that a lot to the guests who travel with me on tours, because my point is, if you walk away from Italy feeling like this was a death march, you never really got Italy. If you really want to get Italy, especially Florence, let's say you want to get Florence, okay, go and see a, a Renaissance painting, but it doesn't have to be the Uffizi. But if you really want to get Florence, sit in a piazza with a Negroni, watch the sunset and the beautiful blue sky, but behind, yes, behind the, sure. the Palazzo Signoria, you know, learn who the Medici are, like you should learn who they are, like in some way, it doesn't need to be the Uffizi, could be Palazzo Medici Riccardi, could be something else, learn who they are, see a little bit of art, but above all, like get into Italian culture, take a passeggiata, put on your nicest clothes and go walking down the street, with a gelato just to kind of like people watch sit on yeah. a square and drink a cocktail and having a petty chain now and pretend like you have friends like <laughs> pretend you, you know hang out on the Ponte uh, Santa Trinita you know just go hang out on the bridge at sunset and it's just full yeah. of people enjoying the sunset walking their dog um and in Rome certainly you know the piazzas I know people used to love to sit on the Spanish steps and that's not really a thing anymore but mm -hmm. all over Rome you can go and sit at a cafe Piazza di Pietra I mean it's an absolute salon of just enjoying the the views, enjoying you know the beauty around you, and you absolutely can. I um, 
I once visited Paris with a friend like that. He was a Paris file and um, we just went up there and hung out. Um, and he said, I don't want to make any plans. And we just walked around and we decided to stop and have a drink. And it's like, oh, there's the Eiffel Tower over there. I mean, we had both been up it, but it's sort of like you just enjoy a city for as you're sort of living it. And I think a lot of people like to do that. They want the idea that they're living, you know, this experience. And I think it's it's uh, the one of the best ways to really get to know Rome is to try to sort of live it that way, sort of yeah. walking around in, or Florence as well, um, sitting in a piazza, enjoying a drink, watching the world go by. Um, and that's actually true for pretty much anywhere in Italy, you know, uh, Piacenza, Bologna, Ravenna, you know, plunk yourself down in a piazza and and just see what happens around you. Yeah. And this is the thing I, I wish that I could scream from the rooftops is you don't have to do the things people tell you. What's more important is that you walk away with a feeling because we don't remember ideas or facts so much as we remember our feelings. And how did you feel being there? How did you feel walking through that piazza? You know, And maybe use that as a guide to figure out what it is you want to do. What is the feeling you want to take Absolutely. away from a yeah. place? I think if you walk away from Florence, feeling stressed out and all of that. And you don't feel elegance. You should feel elegance, I think. I think in Rome, you should feel richness, you know, because there's such richness. So if, if those are words you don't walk away with from those cities, maybe you should re-examine the way you put together your itinerary because you, it should, you should feel an elegance in Florence. You should sit for a really nice glass of wine at a Ninoteca and just ponder you know you should learn about the architecture and the art okay but do that in the way that kind of works for you maybe you take a food tour instead of doing something more um straightforward so anyway so that leads me to a question then uh because i know i've had you for a very long time and you probably want to eat dinner <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. so let pl please tell me what is your top non popular like un, unpopular thing that you would suggest doing in Florence maybe one or two things that maybe are not obvious but you think are important um okay let's see oh there are so many most of them involve art <laughs> well okay. yeah I would say um to see the Medici chapels um I think it's easy to miss those because you have to book them and um you have to kind of know about them and it's not going to be on a two and a half day trip to Florence in a sort of a typical itinerary where you're trying to see, you know, David and the Uffizi and sense of, you know, these certain churches and uh, Piazza della Signoria and stuff. I think the Medici chapels is one of the most astounding places I've ever seen in my life. I mean, not just in Florence, besides the Michelangelo sculptures, but just the, the the beauty of this space. It's very interesting. And speaking of getting to know who the Medici were, you don't even need to do a huge amount of studying. You know, you can go in there and read the little blurbs um, on the on the uh, those little plexiglass things they have, and you'll get a sense of them. And if this museum of, of these chapels doesn't give you a sense of the Medici and the wealth they had and lost, um, nothing will. So I think that's one of one of the most astounding places to visit and and um, and not miss. But it's it would be easy to miss it because you have to make an, an effort to go there. It is it's semi obvious because it is part of that whole um, circuit that we were talking about. You know of, of different things. You know it's on the Bargello page. Yeah, but I don't think a lot of people actually take the time to go there. My my top pick is the Medici Riccardi chapel or palace because that's where they actually lived <laughs> you yeah, know that's another kind of, i mean absolutely it's a super underrated site and you go in there and that's actually where they lived and there's that beautiful beautiful chapel um so there's just there's a, i think there's a lot of fun little unsung heroes i guess you could say of florence things that you know nobody really talks about but that are totally worth your time um Last i would say we were walking there sorry to interrupt but we yeah. walked past the casa di dante you know dante's house oh that's know, so cute that's go, fun. we have to go visit that i mean i've never been inside so i really want to go visit that because hey. alessandro's hero is is dante so <laughs> it's it's a little goofy it's okay i know I but you know just I have to, I have to see it, but you know, it's just one of these little things, but I do think, I think you're right. The Medici stuff is really important because, um, you know, they, they were Florence for, for centuries and uh, very, very important to the history. So yeah. 
Yeah. Well, that is probably all we have time for, even though you and I have been known to sit and talk for hours. <laughs> oh, really? I have no idea oh, really? how that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel weird not being in Rochelle with a glass of wine with you, though. That I know. Just get over like here. Wrong. We miss you. Get back here. <laughs> I know. Well, I'll be back. I'm coming, I promise. And, and actually, uh, Alyssa and I are talking about maybe doing a couple of YouTube episodes together. So hopefully this summer. We're definitely going to do those. Yes. You and I can work on some collaboration stuff. So, um, so those of you who joined us late, just to remind you who you who you were watching, uh, this is Alyssa Bernard, who is the the goddess of Romewise. Who honestly, I think <laughs> oh, I love that. The most, it's probably the most comprehensive website on Rome. I mean, with very detailed reporting about hours, ticket prices, strategies, all that stuff. It's kind of like a free online guidebook that really is super comprehensive. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, you're no, I super respect what you, you do a great job. She's just started Florence wise, which is the same thing, but for Florence. So that's being built. Uh, and yeah, so she's, she's my girl in Rome. So thanks. Sarah. I, I can't wait to see you back here soon. I know I want to come back soon too. So, and eventually forever, as I keep saying. <laughs> That will be even better. Ready and waiting. <laughs> well, thank you all, all of you out in the audience for watching us today. And just as a reminder, uh, Coffee Chat, we're going to try to do these on Mondays as often as I can. And if you want to listen to archived Coffee Chats, we have a podcast. Did you know that? Maybe you didn't know that. It's called Drinks with Sarah. And it's either me drinking coffee or drinking wine with cool people all over the world. You can find it on Spotify. You can find it on Apple Podcasts. And I'd love for you to subscribe because we did all this work putting all of our interviews up there and nobody knows it exists so <laughs> go find I think it that's just awesome i would love to talk more about that and listen to your other other chats with people so thanks for sharing that well thank you so much Alyssa, and i hope to see you very soon for a glass of wine and a little stroll around rome <laughs> ready when you are <laughs> thanks okay. Sarah. thanks for joining us ciao everybody ciao